Welcome to today's webinar, Precision Oncology, Potential of Liquid Biopsy to Enhance Tumor Profiling Capabilities in Breast Cancer Management, hosted by Dark Daily and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. My name is Liz Carey, Managing Editor at the Dark Intelligence Group, here with Ashley Harris, who heads our webinar technical team. If you're not familiar with Dark Daily, it is one of several clinical laboratory and diagnostics news and business information resources from the Dark Intelligence Group. You can always learn more about business critical issues by reading the Dark Report, the industry's preeminent source of business intelligence. A reminder that this call is being recorded for playback on demand. Attendees are muted, but you can message us at any time with questions, comments, or needs. Just use the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel. I'll be monitoring the chat. Now, toward today's call, our featured presenter, Dr. Karen Page, works on the utility of liquid biopsy at Leicester Cancer Research Center at the University of Leicester in the UK. Work at Leicester includes research into hematological malignancies, precision therapeutics, and preclinical models for drug discovery. At Leicester, they're researching breast and lung cancer, mesothelioma, and using liquid biopsy and cancer detection, which is the topic of our call today. Welcome, Karen Page. Hi, nice to meet you all. Yes, thank you for joining us. Karen Page is a research fellow in Jackie Shaw's laboratory at the University of Leicester. She's worked in the field of cell-free DNA and liquid biopsy for over 20 years, with her main research interest being the role of liquid biopsies and their utility in breast cancer management focusing on early stage disease, mineral residual disease, acquired resistance to endocrine therapy, and relapse. Karen leads next generation sequencing in the lab, working closely with both clinicians and industrial partners to organize, carry out, and deliver projects that involve testing new products, reagents, and equipment, or comparing methodology. Please take a moment to read these important disclosures. And while we're here, today's program was recorded September 13th, but stay on the line as we plan to have a live Q&A with Dr. Page toward the end of the call. Welcome, Karen. Let's begin by going over what our audience will learn and why it's important. Everyone, please share your questions and comments using the chat feature of your GoToWebinar control panel. Hi, thank you very much for having me on this call today. I'm really excited to be able to share our work with liquid biopsies with everybody. And today, what I hope to achieve is to give you an introduction to liquid biopsies, to review the schematics and workflows that we use at the Leicester Cancer Research Center. I'm going to be introducing liquid biopsies and their use in targeted next generation sequencing for detection of copy number. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, I'm also going to talk about an additional biomarker, circulating tumor cells, and how we can combine that with cell-free DNA as potential utility of the liquid biopsy in breast cancer management. Thank you very much. Okay, so first off, what is a liquid biopsy? Well, this slide illustrates the differences between a traditional tumor biopsy and the liquid biopsy. So we know that a tumor can comprise of a number of different subclones, here shown in yellow and blue on the left-hand side. And this doesn't actually offer any extra information about any other subclones that might be present. In comparison, on the right, a liquid biopsy taken from the blood contains both tumor cell-derived DNA in addition to healthy cell-free DNA. And it's this liquid biopsy which can provide that extra information. A liquid biopsy is also minimally invasive, so it has the potential for longitudinal sampling, which can obtain information over a given period of time. Okay, so what is cell-free DNA? So circulating cell-free DNA is defined as degraded DNA fragments of approximately 50 to 200 base pairs, which are released into the blood plasma from cells, either from apoptosis, necrosis, or active secretion. In addition to blood plasma, it can also be found in other bodily fluids, including urine, sputum, sabrinospinal fluid, pleural fluid, or saliva. Cell-free DNA is a term used to describe various forms of DNA freely circulating in the bloodstream. So for example, circulating tumor DNA or cell-free mitochondrial DNA and cell-free fetal DNA. So it doesn't always have to originate from a tumor. So if we focus in on a component called circulating tumor DNA, 
This is a name given to the tumor derived fragmented DNA which is found in the blood. And changes which are evident in CT DNA can be numerous, and these include point mutations, copy number alterations, chromosomal rearrangements, and changes in methylation. And in recent years, techniques have rapidly evolved to enable researchers to accurately detect such changes. So the next slide illustrates the landmarks in the field of cell-free DNA since it was first identified back in 1948 by Mandel and Mateus, where they detected extracellular nucleic acids in human blood. This was followed in 1977 in a study by Leon et al, which they showed that higher levels of cell-free DNA was found in the serum of those individuals with cancer. Advances in technology meant that studies in the field of cell-free DNA increased hugely, and in 2015, there was another landmark study when Garcia Marillas et al detected mutations in circulating tumor DNA, which was used to monitor minimal residual disease and to predict the likelihood of breast cancer recurrence. Two of our studies to highlight are in 2006, where we demonstrated the importance of careful blood processing in the isolation of cell-free DNA, which is a sometimes forgotten essential first step in cell-free DNA studies. And another in 2012, where we showed genomic analysis of circulating cell-free DNA infers breast cancer dormancy by detection of minimal residual disease up to 12 years post-surgery. And lastly, I just wanted to add on our latest publication, which demonstrates the use of a rapid, cost-effective, shallow whole genome sequencing workflow, which uses limited amounts of cell-free DNA. So this next slide is going to illustrate the potential utility of the liquid biopsy as a diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive marker. So diagnostically, assessment of circulating tumor DNA levels could be used as a reliable biomarker for the early detection of cancer or identification of recurrence. It could also be used prognostically for assessing or predicting tumor burden and predictively for treatment response. It could also be used to identify resistance mechanisms and track the emergence of novel actionable targets. And such applications have been proven in numerous studies in, in breast cancer, in colon, lung, and also melanoma. So I just wanted to give you one example of how CT DNA could be used as an alternative to a standard approach. And this is in assessing treatment response in patients with advanced solid organ tumors. So this is currently carried out using radiological criteria, and this is usually based on the RESIST criteria here in the UK. However, regular imaging can be expensive. It means that patients are repeatedly exposed to radiation. So continuous monitoring of changing levels of CT DNA during both the initiation and maintenance of cancer therapy could be used to assess the patient's response without the need for such repeat imaging, and more importantly, to detect progression before it's clinically evident. So this slide here is moving towards um, what we do in the lab and looking at those analytical approaches for the detection of CT DNA. So we can, we can separate these analytical approaches into two distinct categories. Firstly, those approaches which are targeted methods, they have high resolution, and in most cases interrogate only a single or a few mutations with high sensitivity. And these are such as digital droplet PCR, and targeted sequencing approaches. The second category is those more comprehensive or untargeted genome-wide approaches, which require a certain amount of tumor DNA in the circulation, typically between five and 10% to achieve these results. And these are um, approaches such as whole exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. So each approach has different advantages. So comprehensive approaches don't rely on recurrent hotspot mutation knowledge or any knowledge about the molecular landscape of the respective tumor samples. However, targeted mutations, on the other hand, are able to detect mutant alleles even if they're underrepresented. So it does really depend on what the research question is. And in addition, these techniques also vary in the amount of template DNA required and their sensitivity. There can be difficulties with CTDNA analysis as it usually comprises only a minute fraction of the total cell-free DNA pool, 
which can sometimes be low in itself. And this can be problematic as many techniques require higher DNA amounts than can be isolated from a typical plasma sample. In our lab, we routinely use cell-free DNA techniques such as those highlighted here. And as mentioned before, those techniques will very much depend on the research question. To give you some context on the amount of cell-free DNA you can expect, healthy individuals rarely have more than 30 nanograms of cell-free DNA per mil, with most having less than 10 nanograms. However, in late stage malignancies, higher levels can be observed. So therefore, with approaches such as these and trying to uh, tackle early detection of cancer, the amount of CT DNA can be negligible. So any analysis will need to be both sensitive and reliable. Okay, so moving on to schematics and workflows that we use in our laboratory. This slide here shows us very simple schematic of our liquid biopsy workflow. So moving from left to right after venous section, the blood sample is processed to plasma using centrifugation. The buffy coat interface is removed and stored along with the plasma at minus 80 degrees. The Kingfisher Flex instrument is used to isolate cell-free DNA from plasma and genomic DNA from a matched buffy coat sample. The Kingfisher system also has the potential to try and capture CTCs for further downstream studies. And in parallel, our collaborators at Imperial College in London analyze a matched blood sample for the enumeration of circulating tumor cells, which can then be isolated and recovered using the DEP array system, which is a microchipped based digital sorter, which combines precise fluidics and microelectronics to enable precise image-based isolation, single circulating tumor cells. So once we have the DNA, either from the plasma, or CTCs or the buffy coat and that's prepared. We want to quantify it and we want to then employ downstream applications such as next generation sequencing using the Iron Torrent platform. So on the next slide we're just going to focus in on the blood processing and the isolation of CFDNA and this is using the Kingfisher instrument and this is just going to look in a little bit more detail than on the previous slide. So the blood sample which is taken undergoes a two-step centrifugation process in order to separate the plasma from the packed red blood cells, here shown in red at the bottom, and the buffy coat interface, here shown in white. So once that plasma has been prepared, it's then divided into either one mil aliquots and stored at minus 80 degrees, or the CFDNA is immediately extracted using the Kingfisher Flex instrument. And here we use a protocol for either a two mil or a four mil plasma volume prep. And then what I've also done here is enlarged the Kingfisher image to show you really the principle of the magnetic particle processing because the Kingfisher instrument works using a magnet to move magnetic beads which bind the CFDNA systematically through the machine and it finally elutes the DNA from the magnetic beads in a volume of approximately 90 microliters. Okay. So taking that 90 microliters of eluted DNA, this slide shows the potential downstream applications of that DNA. So once you have that DNA from either your plasma or your buffy coat, it needs to be quantified because you need to know how much you have. So in our laboratory, we, we routinely use two different methods. We generally quantify the buffy coat using a qubit fluorimeter. And this measures the fluorescence of a molecular dye and produces a measurement of concentration related to the absorbance. For cell-free DNA, we tend to use the Agilent tape station, which is an established high-throughput automated electrophoresis platform. And this basically gives a really good idea of your quality control of your DNA because it not only gives you a concentration, but it gives you a visual representation of the DNA so you can see the fragment sizes as well as actually how much you have. This is really good moving forward to library preparation and sequencing because you can visually see how much amplifiable DNA you have to work with. So as previously mentioned, we'll take that cell-free DNA and that can be used after QC for a number of different applications from whole exome sequencing or targeted next generation sequencing, digital droplet PCR, 
or shallow whole genome sequencing, depending on your research question. And then finally, we may employ some bioinformatic analysis if that's required. Okay, so the next few slides, what I really want to do is show you how it's possible to use liquid biopsy um, in managing breast cancer. So this slide really sort of shows, you know, how can we use liquid biopsies to help us in that curable period? So once that patient has been diagnosed with breast cancer, they will undergo treatment and then they will essentially come off treatment. And then there is that window. There's a window of opportunity where we can use cell-free DNA to predict recurrence or monitor treatment. Um, and this is possible because the limit of detection of cell-free DNA is greater than you can see on routine scans as depicted here by the dotted lines. So it can pick up a much smaller tumor burden. That's the axis on the left-hand side. So a number of studies, including our own, have shown it's possible to identify metastatic recurrence using cell-free DNA before it is evident by imaging. And on the following slides, I'm going to present some of our published research relating to the monitoring and detection of recurrence. So we've been working in the field of next generation sequencing for about 10 years now. And back in 2013, we obtained the PGM or personal genome machine, which was our first instrument within the Iron Torrent platform. And this enabled us to start interrogating cell-free DNA using targeted next generation sequencing. We started work with the commercially available cancer hotspot version two panel. We got that working and it got us thinking about, well, that's great, but how can we custom design a panel to really focus in on what we're interested in? So we designed our first custom panel for investigating the presence of estrogen receptor mutations as these mutations are starting to emerge as predictors of endocrine therapy resistance in the breast cancer, in the metastatic breast cancer setting. So this slide shows serial sampling of a blood research sample with corresponding CFDNA levels and CA15-3 levels. And this is a marker that's routinely used in breast cancer. And it shows these alongside the treatment and information on metastatic sites and progression. And as you can see by the purple line on the graph, a PIK3CA mutation emerged four months into the study, and the mutation frequency of that mutation increased through treatment and correlated with the clinical course of the disease as assessed using CA15-3. So on the next slide, we can see the same graph. just shows an estrogen receptor mutation was also detected in the third and fourth blood samples from this patient, but at a much lower frequency. So this estrogen receptor mutation was validated using digital droplet PCR in the lab, and it was shown to give close agreement with this, Senate, this sequencing data. So this basically told us that early identification of ESR1 mutations might allow for the stopping of ineffective endocrine therapies and enable switching to other treatments before the emergence of metastatic disease. So following on from this work, on the next slide, in 2014, together with the Thermo Fisher White Glove team, we designed a much larger custom panel. It had 150 amplicons and covered 16 genes. And it was the first targeted next generation sequencing study of cell-free DNA to concurrently evaluate both somatic mutations and gene-specific applications in metastatic breast cancer research samples. So the next slide shows the results from this study of how liquid biopsy has the potential to help guide treatment. The upper graphs here illustrate cell-free DNA, CA15-3 and hotspot mutational burden, and the lower graphs depict gene-specific copy number in two different research samples, A and B. So both A and B had gene-specific amplification detected in cell-free DNA when the disease was progressing, and CA15-3 and cell-free con cell DNA concentrations were rising. 
and both A and B showed a response with loss of gene amplification and mutations in cell-free DNA on switching from an aromatase inhibitor therapy to chemotherapy. For sample A, despite having more than 3,500 mutations, no alterations were detected or acquired in the three sequential cell-free DNA samples during nine months of monitoring on therapy. Although total CFDNA concentrations in CA15-3 were both rising. Amplification of MYC and ERB2 genes was detected in the fourth CFDNA sample at the time of pulmonary progression. And this was accompanied by a marked rise in cell-free DNA and CA15-3. After treatment was switched to cat cytobine for a month, a CT scan showed a partial response by resist criteria at the time of the fifth blood sample. And MYC and ERB2 gene amplifications were undetected and the CF CA15-3 levels were falling. For sample B, the disease was in remission at the time of the first two samples, which showed no alterations in cell-free DNA although CA15-3 concentrations were rising and remained increased. The disease worsened over the next six months and treatment with paxitaxel was started. The disease continued to worsen and a third blood sample showed an ESR1 and a PIK3CA mutation, both with a high variant allele frequency. And this was accompanied by CCND1 amplification, shown on the bottom graph. There was then a change in treatment to epirubicin, after which a good response was seen at samples four and five with a CT scan showing stable disease and the mutations resolved in a cell-free DNA. So while there's a lot of information on this slide, what I really want you to take home from this is that using the liquid biopsy longitudinally can really help look at whether treatment changes should occur and they can show you that resistance to mutations can also occur but can also resolve and be changed if those treatments are switched. So this study really showed that alterations were evident in cell-free DNA and that these changes could potentially herald a change in treatment. So I'm going to move to the next slide. So as technologies advanced in the field of targeted next generation sequencing, we were asked to take part in beta testing the Oncomine breast cell-free DNA assay from Thermo Fisher. And here due to the low prevalence of ctDNA in the blood, tag sequencing technology is utilized, which attaches a unique molecular tag to the gene-specific primers. And the amplified products are then grouped into families which contain the same tag. So families that contain the same mutant variant will be called during the using the variant caller software. And additionally, families that contain random errors, which can typically be generated through the library construction or sequencing process, can be identified and removed from the variant calling. So unlike other technologies with limits of detection between one and 5%, the Oncomine breast self-reading assay has a much more flexible detection limit right down to 0.1%, or one mutant copy in a background of a thousand wild type copies. In order to achieve this, 20 nanograms of input DNA is typically required, as shown on the graph. However, lower amounts of cell-free DNA can be used, right down to one nanogram, but the limit of detection will be higher depending on the input amount. So the next slide really shows the reproducibility and the sensitivity of the Oncomine breast CFDNA assay when using the Horizon cell-free DNA reference standards. And enlarged here, it's a consistent detection down to 0.1% fractional abundance when using 20 nanograms of total cell-free DNA. So the next slide I wanted to talk about because it gives an example of, of how the liquid biopsy has been used in the UK um, as part of a Genomics England phase one pilot study. And the question really was, is plasma-derived cell-free DNA collected by genomic medicine centers of sufficient quality to be used for ctDNA profiling? So this is describing a study where the potential of using liquid biopsies for ctDNA profiling was investigated by two collaborating centers, the University of Leicester and the University of Cambridge. And this formed phase one of the Genomics England ctDNA pilot study. 
And this research study compared targeting sequencing of 188 different plasma samples and three different standards, which was split between Innovata at the University of Cambridge and University of Leicester at Leicester. The samples that we used were from a range of different cancers and different stages, and they were sent blind. So basically, we had no sample or clinical data at all. They were from a, from a mix of EDTA and STREC blood tubes, and the standards themselves were actually identifiable. So the analysis also served to further establish the capacity of the InVision Cancer Panel from Innovata and the Pan Cancer Cell Free Assay from Thermo Fisher to really identify the presence of cancer. So the results from this phase one pilot study. So this slide shows, although there was a slight difference in the number of samples tested, overall the results were very comparable, with both panels having a high pass rate for QC metrics, and also detection of driver mutations in approximately half of all samples tested. So in summary, the results of the study were twofold, really. First, it showed the plasma samples collected were actually of a high enough quality to be analyzed, which is obviously very important. And secondly, they produced reliable results with both panels and that the results were consistent across the cancer types. So this suggested the potential for the liquid biopsy to be used in improving cancer management and outcome for UK patients. And I just wanted to add in this slide here because it gives a really nice brief summary of the outcome of the Genomics England pilot project and the potential use of the liquid biopsy as a less invasive, potentially early detection approach for the future of patient care here in the UK. Okay, moving back to the research setting, further to this Genomics England pilot phase one study, we also undertook a collaboration with Innovata to carry out a cross center study to compare their InVision cancer assay with the Oncomine breast assay. But this time we were purely focused on breast cancer research samples. So on this slide, hopefully you'll see there's good agreement between the InVision cancer assay and the Oncomine breast cancer assay. What the slide shows is that there's a small representation of results as shown here, but there was good agreement between the two assays in terms of variant allele fraction being very comparable for a large number of hotspot mutations. And this was seen across a large number of research samples. So we concluded that using the Oncomine breast CFDNA assay would be a good assay to explore the breast cancer landscape. So the next few studies, next few slides, sorry, um, I'm going to continue to talk about our research. And this one was where we continued using our studies using that Oncomine cell-free breast assay. And we expanded our studies to include over 370 different breast cancer research samples because we really wanted to try and det detect the prevalence of ctDNA across healthy controls, across DCIS samples, and across primary and metastatic research samples. And this slide here shows an, oncoming, an oncoprint from our published paper, and it illustrates the spectrum of mutations present using this assay across different breast cancer research samples. And as you would expect, it was the metastatic breast research samples that had the most mutations present, with mutations within ESR1, PIK3CA, and P53 genes the most prevalent. And in fact, mutations within these three genes accounted for 93% of all the mutations detected. And you might say, well, why don't you use a larger panel? Because then you could look for more. And yes, that's a possibility. And although larger panels are available that contain a large number of mutations, as more than 93% of the mutations detected were just in these three genes, and the fact that these mutations also predicted poor overall survival in those metastatic research samples, it suggests that this assay and the use of the liquid biopsy could potentially detect mutations of clinical importance, such as ESR1, as previously mentioned, because we have those emergence of new mutations which can herald resistance to aromatase inhibitors. 
So moving forward from sort of pre-designed commercially available panels, we wanted to see if we could use a custom targeted sequencing panel, but this time moving away from the metastatic setting and, and really pushing ourselves to see what we could identify in a cohort of early screen detected cancer research samples. So the role of ctDNA in the detection and monitoring of asymptomatic screen detected breast cancer remains unclear because this cohort generally had earlier stage disease and very little circulating tumor DNA. So here what we wanted to do was design an individual targeted sequencing panel for a cohort of 42 different research samples. So a person, 42 different personalized panels. And this schematic shows our methodology. So CFDNA was isolated as previously discussed from a blood sample. And once cancer was confirmed, tumor DNA was also isolated from a formalin fixed paraffin embedded block. We then performed whole exome sequencing on the primary tumor and its matched buffy coat, which gave a normal germline control from which we could compare the tumor to. So these were subjected to whole exome sequencing, after which somatic mutations were then selected for for a patient-specific sequencing assay. So these were mutations that were was specific to the research sample itself. And mutations which were present in the germline samples were eliminated. So for every assay we designed, there were between nine and 26 somatic mutations specific to each research sample. Okay, so the next slide shows the results of this study and it illustrates each research sample and the prevalence of self circulating tumor DNA as revealed by the presence or absence of mutations. And it's the presence which is depicted by a pink square. The deeper the pink color, which means the higher the VAF. So other clinico-pathological indicators are visible underneath the graph. And these are the stage of the cancer, the tumor size, the status of the lymph nodes, the presence or absence of lymphovascular invasion, the cancer grade, and age. Now, as you can see straight away, the stage one cancers are on the left and the stage two cancers are on the right. And as you can see, the majority of mutations were detected in stage two cancers, but the prevalence was very low and actually only 14% or six out of 42 of the research samples were positive for ctDNA using this personalized approach. So we concluded that ctDNA was detected in both stage one and stage two screen detected breast cancer research samples using these personalized and specific assays. And this approach was actually more successful than other studies which have looked at early stage disease with other plasma markers. And to our knowledge, it was the first reporting detailed ctDNA detection in a true breast cancer screening setting using any kind of ctDNA technology. But the low proportion of ctDNA positive patients, despite using a personalized approach, does indicate that using ctDNA mutation detection alone is not likely to be a useful adjunct to mammographic screening. So this brings us nicely on to looking at other markers within the liquid biopsy because I think I've shown you that while you can use circulating tumor DNA, sometimes it's just not practical to use ctDNA alone. And so I think the research community themselves believe that it's possibly, you know, a number of biomarkers for the liquid biopsy which will actually be much more useful. So for a number of years now, our group has also been exploring the utility of circulating tumor cells or CTCs as part of the liquid biopsy. So a CTC is a cell that's been shed into the vasculature or lymphatics from a primary tumor and it's carried around the body in the blood circulation. These CTCs can become seeds for metastatic growth in distant organs, a mechanism that's responsible for the vast majority of cancer related deaths. And the detection and analysis of CTCs can greatly assist early prognosis 
and determine appropriate tailored treatments. However, currently there's only one FDA approved method for CTC detection and enumeration, and that's the cell search system. So on the next slide, I wanted to just give you some information on CTC enumeration and isolation methods. So our collaborators at Imperial College have used both the cell search system and the parsortic system to enrich and stain CTCs for enumeration. So CTCs express cytokeratin on their surface and the cell search system captures these cells using specific antibodies and then they can be counted. Whereas in comparison, the parsortic system uses microfluidic technology to capture CTCs based on their size. So our collaborators have actually used both methods, but the most work we've been, the most work has been done on using the cell search system. So once these CTs, CTCs have been identified using the cell search, they can then feed that into the DEP array instrument to isolate and recover single CTCs for downstream analysis thus allowing us to investigate their potential alongside matched CFDNA samples. So this next slide just shows some work from a study which we published back in 2015. Single CTCs were isolated by the DEPARE system and they were subjected to whole genome amplification using AMPLI-1 technology from silicon, silicon biosystems. So briefly following cell lysis, DNA was digested with a restriction enzyme and adapters were ligated onto the DNA fragments. Amplification was then mediated by a single highly specific PCR primer. And after whole genome amplification, we used targeted next generation sequencing to look at a total of 50 genes in five research samples who had over 100 circulating tumor cells as counted by cell search. And we also sequenced the matched cell-free DNA. And as you can see here on this nice sort of pictogram is that the cell-free DNA gave mutations in different genes. And we looked at five individual CTCs from a single patient, but mutations were only picked up in two out of the five single CTCs. So therefore, there was no ctDNA present or evidence of ctDNA in the remaining three. So these results showed that overall, cell-free DNA reflected CTCs in those patients because mutations were seen in both. But in some cases, it was a case of mutations were seen in cell-free DNA, but not in the individual CTCs. So looking at the same research samples, we also wanted to interrogate those CTCs for evidence of clonal copy number alterations, particularly to see what was going on in those three patients who didn't have any mutations. So in this example, the mutations, using the same example as the previous slide, sorry, the mutations are only detected in two out of five CTCs. But here, we've got all five individual CTCs in a circle, moving into the inside, which is the genomic DNA control shown in yellow. And this is the normal germline DNA. So as you can, what I really want to sort of draw your attention to is that kind of like five o'clock, uh, that's chromosome eight, and you can see in each of the five CTCs, there's lots of red dots, which are showing clonal amplification of a particular region containing the gene MYC on chromosome eight. And where the arrow is at about 10 o'clock for chromosome 17, you can see the same thing is happening and this is actually a gene region which contains the ERB2 gene or the HER2 protein. And this is a really important gene in breast cancer because this, is, this defines whether you can have treatment if you're HER2 negative or HER2 positive. So despite no evidence of ctDNA in three out of the five CTCs on the previous slide, when we're looking at mutations, we can see clonal copy number in all five looking at those regions on chromosome 8 and chromosome 17. So this supports the theory that it's possible to get extra information if we do concurrent analysis of both cell-free DNA and CTCs from the same research sample. Okay, so continuing with copy number analysis. 
So when there's sufficient tumour content present, we know that shallow whole genome sequencing approaches can characterise somatic copy number alterations in cell-free DNA. However, current approaches using Illumina workflows, for example, as referenced here, require quite large amounts of templates, so nanogram amounts, which can be prohibitive in many research samples. So we therefore sought to try and repurpose the Iron RepreSeq PGS kit, which was currently designed for the detection of chromosomal aneuploidy for embryo pre-implantation analysis, and to try and use a much smaller amount, so use picogram amounts of cell-free DNA to try and detect copy number alterations. Because by using a, slow, uh, a lower input amount, it ensures that DNA is still available for other investigations if required. So here is a schematic for our shallow whole genome sequencing workflow on the next slide. So the single cells will be isolated by DEPARE and they will all be en ending to be a single cell in a single tube. So that cell is then lysed in its original tube and it's subjected to whole genome amplification to increase the amount of DNA template. We then perform shallow whole genome sequencing and this generates millions of reads. These reads are then aligned to a reference genome and a copy number profile across all chromosomes is generated. So using this approach to repurpose the Iron RepreSeq PGS kit for the detection of copy number, on the next slide, we show that we analysed a cohort of 105 metastatic and 23 breast cancer CFDNA research samples. The sequencing data was analysed by both the tailored iron reporter workflow and also iCore CNA, which is a software programme which takes those BAM files from iron reporter and generates a copy number profile and also gives an estimation of the tumour fraction. So on this slide, I just wanted to give you some example profiles of three different research samples from each cancer type, metastatic cancer on the left and primary breast cancer on the right. And copy number gain or amplification is shown in red and copy number loss or deletion is shown in green. And I just wanted you to see that these three examples clearly show varying copy number profiles. For example, the metastatic breast cancer research sample at the bottom left there's no green or red, which means that sample is pretty stable. There's no copy number alterations. However, the metastatic breast sample at the top clearly shows lots of red and green. The sample shows a lot of genomic instability. So on the next slide, I wanted to show you some work where we were really focusing in on primary breast cancer research samples. All of these samples had received aromatase inhibitor therapy, such as letrozole or anastrozole, for at least two years. But at the time of blood sampling, they were free of recurrent disease. So using our tailored workflow, and again, analyzing both the iron reporter and iCore CNA, I've shown in the comparative copper number plots here generated by both pipelines, just to give you an example. So we generated plots for all 23 research samples and we identify copy number in three of the 23 research samples as shown here. These three samples were the only samples that correlated with those who showed evidence of clinical relapse. The remaining 20 samples were negative for copy number and negative for recurrent disease, no signs of relapse. We also analysed the matched germline DNA from these copy number positive samples and all three germline DNA samples were negative for copy number. So here we can just show that using a really small amount of initial template in primary breast cancer, it has been possible to identify CT DNA in those patients who relapsed. So on the next slide, we've used the same approach and we've just performed some copy number profiling on multiple single circulating tumour cells alongside their matched CFDNA to see if the same thing was happening from before. So if you can use both CFDNA and CTCs or a combination of both, do you get more information? So presented here is a single CTC alongside the matched CFDNA 
in three different breast cancer research samples. So it's clear to see that the profiles differ first off. The, CT sheet, the CTCs show more instability and they show multiple alterations which weren't present in their matched cell-free DNA. And in one research sample on the bottom row, copy number alterations were evident in the CTCs that would not have been seen if we'd only looked at CFDNA analysis alone. So this can partly be explained by the fact that the majority of cell-free DNA can arise from normal cells, unlike circulating tumor cells, which arise solely from a tumor. They will have a much higher tumor fraction. So this further demonstrates the need for a combination of the two approaches to help us fully understand the molecular landscape Otherwise, we really could miss key information. So the next slide shows the last bit of that study, really, where we wanted to take that metastatic breast cancer cohort and compare the detection of ctDNA by either mutations using the Oncomine breast assay or looking at copy number by RepreSeq. And how best was it to detect ctDNA? So looking at these graphs, and particularly concentrating on the one on the right, there was 27% of sample which showed a presence of both mutations and copy number in the blue segment. And this was compared to 36% of mutations only in the gray. So that was no copy number was detected. There was 25% of samples which showed an absence of both mutations and copy number. So no presence of ctDNA. But what there was, was this 12% of research samples where no mutations were present, but there was clear evidence of copy number in orange. So therefore, if we'd used the Oncomine breast assay alone, this would have stratified these samples as being ctDNA negative. However, the presence of copy number by RepreSeq indicates otherwise. So this really illustrates the potential for using this RepreSeq technology, this shallow whole genome sequencing workflow, in addition to other methods, for example, targeted sequencing, to really fully determine the presence of ctDNA, because this then could enable guidance of treatment as well. And on the next slide, what I really want to do by finishing up is just show how we believe CTCs can help guide treatment decisions in metastatic disease using both a targeted sequencing approach and looking at copy number as well. So really bringing together everything that I've been talking about today on this one slide. So this shows results from a matched cell-free DNA and single CTCs from one single research sample that was taken at the point of disease progression. So copy number present in the cell-free DNA on the bottom left demonstrated a change of phenotype in HER2. So the primary tumor was HER2 negative, but in the CFDNA of the metastatic sample, we could see presence of amplification in the ERB2 gene. There was also amplification of the region containing FGR1 and deletion of regions containing BRCA2 and RB1. Analysis of the CTDNA, the CTCs, sorry, provided this information and additional information. So it showed that further actionable gains in regions containing JAK2, CCND1, and CDK6 amplification were present, with additional loss in regions containing BAT1. So this example shows how cost-effective shallow whole genome sequencing could guide treatment in the metastatic setting, where it could be feasible to sample longitudinally, and this would better inform effective treatment switches. And this is important because at disease progression here, this sample was switched from a standard of care treatment, letrozole and ribociclib. So letrozole is a potent non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor and ribociclib is a selective CDK4-6 inhibitor. But based on this liquid biopsy data, other targeted therapeutic opportunities were possible, including switching treatments because they're now HER2 positive, plus they have amplification in FGFR1 regions. And in addition, given that the primary target of the CDK4-6 inhibitor is actually RB1, this liquid biopsy interrogation 
shows the loss of expression of the region which contains RB1. So therefore, this would not support the use of ribociclib as a treatment. So we really feel that using a combination of CTCs and CFDNA within the liquid biopsy can really help guide treatment decisions, particularly in the metastatic setting. Okay, so to summarise, really, I hope I've been able to show you that our results show it's possible to use liquid biopsy to monitor clonal evolution and response to therapy through mutations and copy number changes in cell-free DNA. I've shown you that approaches enabling detection of somatic mutants at low VAFs, such as 0.1%, open the door to the liquid biopsy in early stage disease. I've shown that mutations in CTCs are generally reflected in CTDNA, but mutations in small populations of CTCs could be missed if we only look at CTDNA analysis alone. So it's desirable to interrogate multiple CTCs and CTDNA at multiple time points as both may be needed to guide more appropriate therapy upon relapse. And finally, that liquid biopsies can potentially offer a near complete picture of tumour heterogeneity and they are available when a tumour tissue biopsy is limited or unobtainable. So thank you very much. This slide just shows my acknowledgement to all those that have been involved in the studies over the years, both at the Imperial College London and at the University of Leicester, and also our collaborators in the different teams in Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thank you very much. Liz, are there any questions from the audience, please? Can we open it up to questions? <laughs>